Here we go. Um, fantastic. Um, and yeah, I want to uh, present my pet project that I really spent most of my, ooh. Oh, it's fine. Oh. Come back. Come, come back, okay. Uh, my pet project, which is uh, Speedy Weather. Uh, and with Speedy Weather, Speedy Weather is an um, atmospheric circulation model. So you can solve the equations of motion, a bunch of different ones we have implemented in order to simulate how the weather over the globe is um, evolving. And my, really my incentive with this model is that, and that's why sometimes I give it the slogan like, play atmospheric modeling like it's Lego, that you, um, instead of just building another weather forecast model or whatever you want to use it for, to build something where you can very easily plug and play a lot of um, components in and out and really use it in this idea of like power to the user. Um, obviously a lot of thanks also goes to basically try to write everyone down who contributed to this uh, repository in one way or another. Um, and so yes, there's a lot of contributors even though I think most of the heavy lifting is still uh, unfortunately on my side, which uh, doesn't have to be that way. Um, and so Speedy Weather's niche is really this like if you think about um, atmospheric models, or I think the same probably also holds for ocean models, there is a trade-off between models that are really like complex and physically accurate and those ones that are really easily usable. Um, I feel there's still like a, like a, there's kind of like a, a niche, a gap in between where you have a few models that are really developed to be um, super, um, yeah, super accurate, uh, run in like big weather forecasting centers, uh, and then there's a lot, couple of toy models, and there's kind of like a gap in between. Um, at the moment, Speedy Weather somehow still falls into this little gap, um, but by using Julia and some of the concepts that we'll present in the next minutes, um, I'm hoping to like, I have already pushed it much more to the usable and extendable uh, end of this graph, and my master plan is that this really becomes kind of like the, where the power to the user really um, starts to explode then uh, once it is a platform that people can use easily that basically its physical accuracy will just shoot up and kind of reach a completely new um, area in this, in this graph. So where are we? Um, I already talked about Speedy Weather last year. I realized, actually just looked it up yesterday, that back then we were at version 0 0.5, now we're at version 0 0.10 and I actually would like to release the 0 0.11 also soon. What do we have gained since? Um, I've wrote a lot of documentation in the last year, so I feel like if anyone wants to learn something about how to do global atmospheric modeling, you can almost use this as a textbook and <laughs> how to uh, yeah, understand how we're actually solving these equations, how we derive some of the, some of the stuff that uh, has to be derived on the way. We also have a JOS paper out now if anyone is keen to understand a little bit of our approach to this idea of like how can I write a model that is somehow extensible, which I believe actually applies to much, much more than just atmospheric models. And so if anyone is keen on that, please reach out. Um, then a bunch of videos that are produced in the last years. There's one here now of cloud cover at the moment. Unfortunately, cloud cover is still diagnostic, so it basically just checks okay, where's humidity reaching 100%? It doesn't really interfere with radiation, which is unrealistic. This is something that we definitely have to work on. And I've also run like some simulation at a somewhat higher resolution where you can see humidity somewhat just up above the surface uh, being moved around. But there's still a lot of things unrealistic. So in the Amazon, for example, that's, oh, that's this area here. Maybe you've spotted that. Uh, there should be a much more stronger daily cycle, and that's uh, currently not the case because there's a lot of like fluxes, what we just heard about, uh, that are not done right. Um, oh, now I see that again. Um, and so to, this, to, to get to this like power of the user, because there's technically like so much complexity in, we build a couple of features in that makes the whole thing a bit more approachable, a bit more like, hey, what can I actually do? So in the case of a user saying like, what, how, what can I do and how can I do it? Um, we basically, Speedy Weather is always, everything is put into this like simulation object. Uh, simulation object is then always split into the prognostic variables that really determine the current state, the diagnostic variables, everything that you have to somehow in compute um, uh, in order to, to get to your next time step. And then the model is basically everything that's supposed to be constant. And you may ask like, okay, what, what can I do? How can I do this? And so we even came up with these things like, um, that, like the tree function, and tree function is basically just inspecting your uh, entire tree of this like simulation object and you can see where different things are. 
So for example, if you just do the tree, you would see like, oh, in the model I have a planet, and maybe I want to have a look at the planet. If you then basically look one level down, you would see, oh, planet has a gravity. And so it kind of tells you without actually looking into the documentation, it tells you maybe you could just create, uh, uh, yeah, create an Earth as a planet, uh, but just set the gravity to one. This is one of the philosophies that we follow. You could also just, because it's a mutable struct, you could just change it. Um, and you could also just define, for example, Mars as a new abstract planet and just set its gravity to something else to have a new uh, component there. And this is basically how a lot of these components try to, try to work. We try to follow this philosophy all the way through so that you can just say, you basically just look at how is the model built up of what are all the components. In the same way, you can basically swap in and out different things as you like. Um, and you can do this in a... In a um, Jupyter notebook, you can do this in a Pluto notebook, you can do this in your REPL, you can do this in a script. Um, a lot of other situations that we come across are like where um, some of my colleagues say like, hey, I would love to use your model, but I would like to add this term. So there was a colleague of mine who said like, I want to add this term S, that's like a stochastic stirring term, and here's the equation, how do I do this? And so we try to develop like a, a philosophy where we say, okay, any term that you can add you, there's a certain number of steps that you have to follow uh, in order to do this, and we try to split this into the, like, the first step being like the defined step. So um, the term that this colleague wanted to, wanted to add is basically a forcing. So you basically create a new type, a struct. You could make it mutable or not mutable. It depends a little bit on what you want, um, but it has to be um, a subtype of this uh, speedyweather.abstract forcing. And then you would basically throw all the parameters that you need, you would throw in there. So that's this first like defined step. And we always have the second like initialized step. So there's anything you want to do somehow up front. For example, you want to know what is the gravity of my planet that someone else has somewhere else defined. And so you can basically, this initialized step is this a kind of communication step between the different model components where you can also load something from file. And then always the third step that you have to define in order to get this in is that in this case, because this is a forcing, you have to extend the forcing uh, method and there's basically it's always the same arguments that you have to put in there and then in this case because this forcing is supposed to be on the vorticity equation you probably want to then change the tendency or accumulate into the tendency of the vorticity and so basically if you follow this rule you can basically just in your notebook you can just say like oh I'm just defining it like this you hit enter some of my colleagues ask me like, hey, if I want to do this, how do I branch off? Where should I so, supposed to branch off? And I'm like, no, 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 there's no branching off. You don't have to branch off. There's no, it's, a, it's just a, it's kind of like a feature. You can just plug that in. You can hopefully, as long as there's no breaking change, it would even work with the next version. Um, and it's even like supposed to work across different, different models because you may add, say like, oh, I want to add the same term into, into a different model. So the way you use this is then really just like that you create this, um, a new forcing object. Here I'm just like calling this like stochastic stirring, and you basically just pass that on to the to the model constructor. And whether you now write barotropic model or shallow water model or primitive um, equation model is then basically the same thing. Um, this is really the idea behind it. And so in this case, uh, this is actually what it looks like. It was some stochastic forcing that just starts to stir a little bit the circulation of the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere. Um, the next cool feature that we have introduced um, uh, in the last months is this callbacks that is also quite um, a famous uh, co concept in machine learning libraries. It's basically just the idea that if you, if you loop through something, um, so a typical time loop you would do in order to solve a differential equation, you have your time step and the callback lets you inject any part of the code directly after this time step. And so we have a Again, basically very similar idea. You can, for example, if, if someone tells me like, oh, can I assess the mass conservation in the model? I'm like, yeah, you can just define a mass conservation type. You make it a subtype of an abstract callback. You can throw in there whatever you want. You have to define the initialized function. You have to define the callback function, so what it's supposed to do on every time step. Uh, and in this case, even you can define the finish function, whatever you want to do at the end of the time step. Um, for example, save something to file. And this is, for example, also how we implemented the a particle tracker, where you just say like a particle tracker at the end of every time step just tracks, okay, where are all my particles now? And this way you can basically just store their location. Uh, and it's a very general way of injecting any code. You could also define like, oh, at, uh, I don't know, at 2100, I want to suddenly change the land sea mask and let basically the entire um, planet be flooded. Because you can just say as a callback, you can just inject that conditionally check when it's supposed to execute and then change something inside the model. It's not a problem. 
I'm going to skip over this. There's a few like little things that I always find helpful, but just to basically finish up with the roadmap, the things that we're still working on is like there's a lot of things around physics, like more realistic radiation that we have to get in, um, different ways to represent climate change, um, sea ice, ocean. Um, I would love to also export, uh, support more exoplanets. So basically, at the moment, the Earth is not hard-coded, but it's not really tested much on other planets. Um, there's a couple of numerics um, things that are basically open issues. Uh, a bunch of software stuff, like how do we best do um, the data output. And there's also a bunch of computing stuff that is currently on my higher up on my to-do list in terms of like GPU uh, computing, which we're like hopefully halfway, halfway, halfway there. And then also what everyone is always waiting for, um, enzyme to be. Uh, to be there so that you suddenly can actually really get more machine learning into your models. If you're interested, have any questions, any ideas, suggestions, really our point of contact is just the issues, so you can always feel always free to just throw in any ideas that you have there. Um, I hopefully will respond in uh, almost no time, and thanks for listening, and I'm excited for the next talks as well. Okay, time for a Quick question, I think. Just one. Oh. We have, okay. Oh, there are a lot of them, actually. Okay, sorry. Okay, please. There are no oceans in Mars, but, but there were in the past. Could you simulate them? Tell guess, us what it guess, was like. Guess what? We have a we have a no ocean type. <laughs> you can just say ocean equals no ocean, and guess what it's doing. <laughs> sorry. Could you, could you tell us what it was like in the past when there were? On, on Mars? Yeah. I don't even know. I know that the orography of Mars is like influenced by like previous oceans because you can see these like how like water masses flew down there, but I actually don't know. No, no, no. I mean, no. It's still like atmospheric circulation. It wouldn't actually simulate the ocean. So the ocean in our case is always like more like boundary conditions. There is plans to go towards like coupling with like ocean anigans. I'm looking at some people there who can probably already come up and uh, um, uh, swap the laptops. Um, there's some plans to like really build an interface so that you can easily um, couple to other, other ocean models that actually dynamically solve uh, and not just like thermodynamically do something with the ocean. Um, but it's a longer story and it's a bit of a bigger one. Okay, I think for yeah. the next questions, we will need to wait for the, for the break.